we support in as much as we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I was actually hoping that the new Secretary of State, Shai Bajana, would be here uh, by the time for this meeting. But as Providence was having time still, I think <laughs> I don't have a date today. Uh, but uh, I do hope uh, she will assume you please uh, give me the course of next month. The Friends of Sri Lanka Association is, was also incidentally the first organization I addressed after assumption of duties here. So uh, I do have this organization quite close at heart. Uh, uh, coming to the, the topic at hand, Professor Peter asked me to talk a few words on the developments in Sri Lanka. Uh, I must say before that that uh, the Sri Lankan overseas community here is believed to be the second largest Sri Lankan overseas community after Canada. And uh, that of course translates into the many diversities, strengths and weaknesses of Sri Lankans that you get back in Sri Lanka being present here in a microcosm. Uh, that also translates into a number of organizations, over 100 in number, or number of Sri Lankan organizations in this country, whether it is all boys and all girls, alumni, uh, so school associations, university alumni, professional associations, associations such as the Friends of Sri Lanka Association, and so on all of whom are advocating and uh, promoting the interests of Sri Lanka in their own different ways. But the Friends of Sri Lanka Association is unique in one way, it is perhaps the only organization that is headed by a non-Sri Lankan. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that speaks volumes for the name itself, that it is truly a French organization, it doesn't necessarily constitute only Sri Lankans, but those who intend to help for Sri Lankans. Uh, for Sri Lanka as a whole, uh, both Britishers uh, and other nationalities living here, as well as Sri Lankans. Uh, so let me uh, also congratulate the Press of Sri Lanka Association for completing 29 years, and uh, I wish it greater strength uh, in the coming year as well in promoting and advocating for Sri Lanka. And uh, that work uh, that is being done by the Press Association <coughs> Assumes also greater relevance in the context of the challenges, the opportunities that we face as a country. Uh, and so, I suppose all of you are aware of the changes that took place in January 2015 and thereafter uh, in, in August 20 last year. Uh, certain words that were in the background of Sri Lankan political uh, lexicon came to the fore. Certain words like good governance, democracy, rule of law, accountability, reconciliation. Not that these did not exist in the Sri Lankan political jargon, but these assumed greater visibility and relevance uh, during that time. And uh, that in itself speaks for the mandate that the government of Sri Lanka, the current government of Sri Lanka, received by its people uh, in two successive elections, one in January, then in August of last year. And uh, over the last one and a half years, the government has endeavored to put into action the mandate it has received. In some ways, the government has made giant steps. In certain ways, there have been certain moderate steps. Uh, in other ways, uh, if I may use the phrase, the baby is beginning to turn over, slide, and get up. Uh, but there are certain positive things that have happened in the country since January 2015. One, I believe, is the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which established certain independent commissions in different areas, like the Police Commission, Public Service Commission, uh, the Human Rights Commission, and so on. Uh, this, these commissions, which existed before, were much criticized, uh, perhaps because appointments to these commissions were made directly by the executive, and it was widely believed uh, to be not independent. However, the 19th Amendment sought to make the procedure uh, much more transparent, to have checks and balances in these appointments, and uh, currently the, 
those commissions uh, are perceived to be uh, in more independent than, than previously. Now, that translates also into positive strides we have made in terms of guaranteeing the independence of the judiciary and the and freedom of expression. Uh, these are certain giant steps. Uh, my generation of Sri Lanka, we have had uh, enormous challenges. Now, in, I'm 43 years old. Uh, in my lifetime, we have had one insurrection in the South, a large separatist terrorist campaign in the North, uh, a tsunami, a devastating tsunami, uh, and minor tragedies in between. So, after having come out of the conflict in 2009, uh, certain strides were made in terms of infrastructure development and so on, but there were certain other issues that needed to be addressed. Uh, issues of democracy, of governance, of uh, rule of law, uh, of ensuring uh, proper reconciliation and accountability, and the government is in the process of addressing those issues. Uh, one uh, form of uh, addressing them is to look at the possibility of enacting an institution, and I believe uh, that is making quite substantial progress. There have been meetings, not only in Sri Lanka, but even in other diaspora communities, including here in London, as well with certain groups who want to provide proposals for an institution. And uh, something is being drafted, the government hopes to come up with a draft perhaps by the end of this year, which can be amended up for further consultations. That will take into account a lot of other issues relating to the devolving of power uh, and uh, addressing certain concerns with regard to governance. Uh, then there is also uh, the government uh, recently uh, the cabinet of ministers have proved and the uh, bill was tabled in parliament on the setting up of an office for missing persons. Now, uh, that is something that was not previously addressed. Uh, it, uh, we do have a large number of missing persons <coughs> due to the country situations that prevail in the country. And uh, it is the belief of the government that certain issues, while it may seem uh, very easy to just sweep under the carpet and with perhaps not acknowledge, it is much more uh, lasting for the victims and their families to acknowledge what has happened and to ensure that there is a closure because perhaps out of the human rights violations that take place, disappearance is one which is quite different from the others. If there is torture, if there is extrajudicial killing, then there is a closure in that. But the disappearance doesn't end. It, you know, you don't, if you don't know what happened to your loved ones, it just goes on and on and on. And so it is a matter of bringing this to a close. So this Office for Missing Persons will, with the ones the bill is approved, will look into these issues and where justice can be dealt with, justice to be dealt with, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where justice can be dealt with, uh, that will be done. Uh, where uh, certain incidents uh, cannot be brought forward further, there is another initiative to issue what is called the Certificates of Absence, where the next of kin will be able to uh, seek compensation and a certain degree of closure. So then there are other mechanisms that are being uh, envisaged public consultations underway on reconciliation mechanisms, on justice, and there comes also a bit of controversy or a challenge that we face in terms of ensuring justice mechanisms and uh, what type of international participation will be in those justice mechanisms as per the laws per the Geneva Resolution. Uh, so those are challenges that we have. We have made certain progress in some areas, uh, not so much progress in some other areas, and there are certain other issues uh, that we need to address. But the government is committed to move along this path because that is the path that is left for us. Uh, one, one cannot uh, think of other areas where without moving in, in 
in this path and ensuring that there's a pro proper reconciliation and bonding between our people. Then there are other areas like the economy which have uh, done well in some areas, remittances have increased, uh, tourist earnings have increased, but and uh, imports have decreased leading to a positive balance of payments. But then there are structural deficiencies in the economy. We do not want to continue to be a country that exports female labor uh, to the Middle East. We do more to move out of that category. And uh, to move out of that category, we need to find ways of boosting our exports, uh, increasing investment in the country, and so on. Uh, and that is then impacted by certain events that take place in other countries, such as the referendum that happened recently, uh, when the world economy is not doing so well, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's dirty. Uh, it does not ensure that investment flows continue to countries such as ours. So those are challenges that we have to face. But having faced a lot of challenges, uh, Sri Lanka can face many more challenges to come and uh, will always depend upon organizations such as the Friends of Sri Lanka Association to, to help in this endeavor. And I thank all of you for the work, great work that you've been doing, and I wish you greater strength in the next year to come. Thank you.